Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we are going to review with you another terrible case. Fear is a negative and unpleasant feeling. Would anyone want to experience it over and over again? Cassandra and her twin brother Rob were the exception. As young children, they couldn't go a day without the scary stories they liked to tell each other in a room with the lights off. Rob was a natural storyteller, or at least he thought he was. Cassandra would scream at every story he told, and he, playing the brave though small man, would sprawl on his bed mumbling, You can't even scare the neighbor's little Joey with stories like that. No, scary stories are not your thing. They also watched the animated series Scooby-Doo together, and while watching it, they argued over which of the characters in the story would turn out to be a ghost or a vampire in disguise. Cassandra's intuitive guesses were often ahead of her brother, and then he was nervous. Their mother, Mary Smith, although she did not share the passion of the twins, but to instill in her children a love of reading, bought them books by Robert Wall. Love for scary stories was not a childhood hobby, but a passion that brother and sister carried through life. They even collected figurines of villains, and as adults, seriously considered opening a themed store associated with this culture of horror. An interest in horror movies brought Cassandra to the set in 2004. She got a cameo in a scary movie that, although it didn't become popular, still caused a storm of envy in Rob, and he started asking his sister to make a deal for him. You must have made some acquaintances there, right? I'm ready to play any one. Well, talk, CAs, please. I'm pretty close with the head of the cast. Maybe something will come out of it, but no promises. I got the part by accident myself, after all. Cassandra replied, Roby was very happy, but to play, albeit in an episodic role, he was not able to. The head of the cast in that movie was Colin Dudley, and on the set between him and debuting actress flashed a spark. To make the first step, each of them did not dare. That all changed during a corporate Halloween party. Cassandra dressed up as Velma from Scooby-Doo, and Colin dressed up as Alex from A Clockwork Orange. And if for Cassandra, the image of the cartoon character was just an image, then for Colin Dudley, it seemed, he was something more. He was walking with a glass of milk all evening, looking at everyone with a glare, just as his character did in the movie. And also, he talked a lot of quotes from the book. For example, looking at Cassandra with delight, he said, Beauty invariably caused my only desire to destroy it, for it did not fit at all into our ugly world. Cassandra thought it was a compliment, and they soon began dating, but their relationship didn't last long, only a couple months. Colin found another actress, Rebecca, and started dating her, and later on the couple started living together. August 25, 2020. Cassandra Cantrell disappeared. She, without warning anyone, drove her car away from home in an unknown direction and did not answer phone calls. The police officers were very reluctant to take a report from her mother for a very long time, trying to calm the poor woman down and saying that sometimes children grow up and don't always warn their parents when they go out with friends. But Mary Smith was sure that something terrible had happened, and maybe if the lazy cops would finally start working, she would still have a chance to see her daughter alive. The search for Cassandra did not begin until two days later, and on the third day, the police found her car under a bridge, not in the most favorable area. Also to add to the bad news, the car was unlocked and the keys were inside. It was impossible to understand what Cassandra was doing here. This place was considered a neighborhood of homeless people, where with frequent frequency the police found their bodies, killed in a domestic fight, or died of an overdose of illegal drugs. The officers had to go around the neighborhood, questioning a lot of homeless people who, at the sight of the police, tried to get away for a while, but it was all to no avail. None of them had seen Cassandra, and none of them knew when the car showed up here. It was hard to expect anything else from the residents who lived under the bridge and drank alcohol all day long. The detective involved in the search for Cassandra had requested her cell phone billing, as he was instructed to do, but from experience he was sure it would get him nowhere. So it did. The signal showed that the phone was in the nearest body of water to the bridge, 
which meant that the detectives would not be able to recover it and get the information they needed. Nevertheless, a team of divers began searching the coastal area, and before they did so, standing on the shore, they picked up rocks from the ground and threw them into the water, testing how far they could throw the phone. Cassandra's mother said that her missing daughter's phone case was decorated with rhinestones, which meant it would not be difficult to find. Indeed, the phone was soon found, but Cassandra's body was not in the water. This was presented to her mother as good news, but the poor woman did not feel any better. She seemed to have gotten used to the idea that her daughter was dead, and the only thing she wanted was for her body to be found, and for this nightmare of uncertainty to end. I was looking forward to my granddaughter. I wanted to be a grandmother sooner and I didn't even have time to give her a crib. It's just sitting in the garage in a box. What should I do with it now? Saddened the mother and did not realize that this became important information for the investigation. According to statistics, a high percentage of crimes against pregnant women are committed by their partners, the fathers-to-be. But Mary Smith did not know who the father of her future granddaughter was. Cassandra, as it seemed to her, despite her already realized age, was not married and did not even meet anyone. It was understandable that she had gotten pregnant by a man, but Mary had no information about the potential father of the child. Although, again from the words of her mother, her daughter very often corresponded with someone and called, but the phone number of her interlocutor for some reason was not recorded in the daughter's book, and the mother of course did not remember the numbers. She just noticed that it is quite strange to communicate so often with a person and not write down his number. Girls, as it was known, could not keep their relationships in absolute secrecy, and there should be at least one friend with whom Cassandra shared her secrets, and especially if those secrets were related to pregnancy. And such a friend was found. In a conversation with police officers, she revealed that Cassandra had rekindled her relationship with her former boyfriend, Colin Dudley. Yes, their past relationship in 2004 was short-lived. And besides, it's been 15 years since their breakup. It is strange in general that after so much time they remembered each other. As it turned out, Colin himself came out to Cassandra, with whom he once worked on a movie set. In 2014, he found Cassandra on Facebook, wrote some warm words and confessed that just recently his father died, with whom his wife, Rebecca, had a difficult relationship, and so he had no one to share his grief with. Cassandra, purely because of friendly motives, decided to meet and talk to the ex-boyfriend to calm him down, but the friendly meeting turned into something more. Since 2014, Colin began to live literally on two families where Cassandra was in the status of mistress. When the young woman found out that she was pregnant, she did not want to inform Colin Dudley, because every time she wanted to admit it to him, she recalled their conversation where Colin said that he absolutely did not want children and that he was very happy about Rebecca being infertile. The news that he might have a daughter or son could destroy a real family, and Cassandra didn't want to hurt her lover, so she kept the news a secret. Meanwhile, her belly was growing, and it was impossible to hide it under the oversized sweaters, and in order to Colin did not guess anything, Cassandra stopped seeing him but how to move on. She couldn't hide it for long, and if she lied about having another boyfriend, it would hurt Colin and cause them to break up. Cassandra decided that the bitter truth was better than a sweet lie, so she told Colin over the phone that she was expecting a child with him. Colin was silent for a while, and then he finally said that he was delighted to hear the news. It sounded very strange, but Cassandra concluded that Colin was genuinely pleased. The detective arrived at Colin's house, knocked on the door, and his wife opened it. Deciding that it wasn't quite ethical to talk about a missing mistress in the presence of Colin's legal wife, the detective introduced himself as an old friend of Dudley's. Colin came out, immediately shut the door behind him, and walked away from the house with the detective, though the latter hadn't even introduced himself yet. It was as if he had been waiting for this meeting. Thank you for not making your credentials public in front of Rebecca. You're a man of honor, a true officer. My compliments to you. Colin spoke in short sentences. I heard Cassandra is missing. It's weird, bloody weird. I can't even guess where she might have gone. 
She told me she'd had a big fight with her brother and was really worried about it. I advised her to stop by and make up with him. I don't know if she listened to me or not. That Cassandra and Rob had been in a fight, the detective knew. Rob had told him about it himself. It was nothing serious, just a family misunderstanding. But nevertheless, Cassandra's twin brother had been very upset about it, because the day she disappeared, Cassandra had called him and wanted to come and talk to him, but his proud brother had refused, and now he blamed himself for it. If his sister had come to see him that day, she wouldn't have disappeared. You know, officer, I'm not the nicest person. I think you realize that. Dating my ex-girlfriend in secret from my wife, and for such a long period of time, I'm sure I'll be punished for it in the next world. But the human heart doesn't decide who you fall in love with. In 2014, my father died. He literally hated Rebecca with all his soul and the feeling was mutual. But he really liked Cassandra. He often remembered her, reproached me for the fact that we broke up with her almost immediately after Christmas. We often fight with our parents, accusing them of not understanding. And then it turns out that it's us, their children, who don't understand, and it hurts. My father was right, of course. And after he died, I just wanted to fulfill one of his wishes, and so I resumed my relationship with Cassandra. Rebecca needed to be broken up with. It was a conversation I kept putting off. You know, this family stuff sucks you dry, so I kept stalling. I've been living a double life for five years. It was hell. I had to make excuses for coming home late all the time. To hide it, I'd tell her about some fictitious business trips and even bought a fishing rod, even though I hated fishing, a stupid pastime. And I'd tell Rebecca I was going to the lake while I went to Cassandra's. Before coming home, I'd buy fish at the supermarket for extra convincing, and Rebecca would bake it in the oven and I'd eat it, even though the smell of fish makes me sick. Did you know Cassandra was pregnant? What? Pregnant? By whom? I don't have that information, but she told a close friend of hers that it was from you. That can't be true. She's been adamantly refusing to see me lately. And I guess I understand her and can't blame her for that. Naturally, she was tired of being in the background and wanted a family, which unfortunately I couldn't give her. I guess that the reason she refused to see me was because she had found someone else. When was the last time you saw her? Asked Detective Colin. Honestly, I can't even remember. I think it was about three months ago, maybe four, if you don't count the time we literally ran into her at the mall by chance. But that was fleeting because my wife was in the fitting room and I just got tired of waiting for her and decided to take a walk to the coffee shop. Tell me, officer, is there any chance you'll find her alive? Dudley asked one last time. We're doing everything we can. Believe me. This was not Colin's last encounter with the detective. Even though Cassandra's phone, which was lifted from the bottom of the pond and could not be recovered, but the police requested the details of the calls of the missing person and it turned out that most likely, the unsigned number about which her mother told her, belongs to Colin Dudley. Most often, Cassandra called him, and even on the day of her disappearance, they called each other. In addition, on that day, the police received CCTV footage from the train station near the bridge, where Cassandra's abandoned car had been found, and on it they saw a strange man who stood out in the crowd of passengers on the platform. He wore a long cloak, gloves, his face was swathed in a scarf, and a hat was placed on his head, the sides of which covered his eyes. It was impossible to make out the face, but the detective said that the man's gait reminded him very much of Colin Dudley. As for the hat, it was almost identical to the one worn by Alex from A Clockwork Orange. After continuing to follow the strange man through the CCTV cameras, the detectives noticed that he literally went into the cafe for a few minutes, then came out of there and went towards the parking lot, where he got into his car and drove away. During all this time, the stranger never showed his face, but they could see the license plate number of the car in which the stranger got into, and the car belonged to Colin Dudley. A unit was sent to his house with a search warrant. The detectives had hope that Cassandra was alive and in the basement at Dudley's house. At first, there was no evidence of a murder at Colin's house, but in the closet, they found the very hat Colin was trying to cover himself with. They then went down to the basement, but Cassandra was not there, nor was there any evidence of the crime. However, the service dog, which was trained to search by the scent of blood, 
barked as it sniffed the couch, and that was already a very alarming bell. Colin assured that he had done nothing illegal, that the police simply had no evidence and no other suspects, so they were trying to pin the crime on him, an innocent man. The detective interviewed his wife, who of course was shocked at what was going on in their home, at the accusations against her husband, and at the fact that she had been deceived for years. Yes, she could say a lot of things about her husband and her emotions, but when the detective asked her if her husband was capable of murder, she, after thinking about it for a long time, answered in the negative. All the evidence that had been found against Colin wasn't enough to put him in jail, which made Rob and Mary Smith very angry, and the detective was just throwing up his hands. Colin was called in for questioning again. He thought carefully about the crime as he had an alibi for all the allegations. On the morning of August 25th at 6.30 a.m., Colin visited a hardware store where he purchased household cleaning chemicals as well as trash bags. And indeed, the store's cameras confirmed it, but the large trash bags overshadowed this situation. Colin then received a text message from Cassandra that she was almost at his house, but he immediately deleted the message, but it remained in the cell phone carrier's memory, and the police got it from the call and message dump. Also, according to their cell phone billing, the couple did not leave the house that morning for several hours. Colin then turned off his phone, but left his mistress's phone on, most likely by accident, and police saw the entire path of his movements, including where he was seen on the station's CCTV cameras. As the police already knew, after the cafe, where he was probably recovering from the murder by washing up in the toilet, Colin got into his car and drove to the pond where he had dumped Cassandra's phone, where the last signal from the cell phone had been received. It was now necessary to search for Cassandra's body. The police, in order to accurately track the route, seized a GPS tracker from Colin's car. The device completely replicated the movement of Cassandra's cell phone signal, but there was new evidence in the case based on his movements the next day. The cops retraced his path that went through the woods, and there in a ravine they spotted a huge trash can tied with ropes. All the ground around it was covered in blood, and it became clear what was in the container. Yeah, they were right. By then, it had been a month since the murder, and identifying the body was difficult. The police were helped by Cassandra's tattoo, which was described in the search notes. Colin was apprehended the same day and charged with murder. Forensics conducted a forensic examination and indicated that death was caused by a fractured skull due to blunt force trauma. During the examination of the basement of the Dudley house, the police found traces of blood which could not be completely cleaned. Rebecca knew nothing about the murder. All day she spent in another part of the house, from which no noise in the basement cannot be heard, and she also confirmed that Colin never wanted children and his story about her infertility, just a fiction. The police took this as a motive for the crime. During the trial, due to the lack of witnesses, physical evidence, such as the murder weapon, it was impossible to convince the jury that the murder was committed by Colin Dudley. Then, the court made a deal with the killer that if he pleaded guilty, he would get a lesser sentence. Colin was sentenced to 26 years in prison. Cassandra's mother and her brother, who still felt guilty that he had not agreed to meet with his sister before her death, were very upset because the killer would most likely live to see the moment when he could go free. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead. See you again.